Our planet is under threat. Human activity is destroying ecosystems, causing the extinction of species and contributing to a climate catastrophe that threatens our very existence. The need for action has never been greater. For more than 20 years, the St Andrews Prize for the Environment has championed people from across the world who are addressing the greatest challenge of our age, protecting the environment and promoting a more sustainable society. Our innovative winners have shown that local solutions lead to lasting change and have the power to inspire and encourage global action. Through their actions, they have transformed and empowered their communities, increasing access to healthcare, education and employment opportunities, reminding us that nature and society are inextricably linked. At Blue Ventures, we work to enable coastal communities to thrive by helping them to rebuild their fisheries and to protect ocean life. In the coastal tropics, we recognise that no one stands to benefit more from healthy marine ecosystems than the 100 million small scale fishers and their families who rely on fishing for food and for income. Back in 2007, whilst working with fishing communities on the west coast of Madagascar, we unearthed a huge unmet need for healthcare. It's not unusual for coastal communities in the tropics to have limited access to basic services. What we saw was that not only was poor health significantly impacting the communities and their way of life, it was impairing their ability to engage in marine conservation. So in 2007, we integrated community-based health services into our programme of conservation activities. Communities grew healthier, they felt more empowered, and they felt better able to engage in marine conservation. Seven years on, I still feel really proud of having won the St Andrews Prize. Winning the St Andrews Prize not only gave us resources to replicate this approach in new areas, it also gave us confidence in the knowledge that this was a valuable and important way of working with communities and delivering on conservation goals. It also gave us credibility within the conservation community and it gave this approach credibility. What started in one village on the west coast of Madagascar serving the needs of 2,000 people has now been replicated numerous times across six countries now serving over 600,000 people living in remote areas of high biodiversity. The hope is that this holistic approach to conservation becomes the default model for community-based conservation all over the world. At Ati, we're addressing three major issues. The first is that both women in urban and rural India face issues with irritation, rashes, and infections, whether it's due to the plastic and chemicals in regular pads or the unhygienic alternatives such as dirty rags or ash. Second, the lack of menstrual hygiene resources impacts girls' ability to stay in school. Almost 23 million girls drop out of school annually in India. Third, the majority of sanitary pads are made of plastic and wood pulp. With only 36% of women having access to sanitary pads in India, that means 21.8 billion pads are clogging up waterways and ending up in our land. We have a holistic business model where we source banana and bamboo fiber from farmers, which we process to make pads in our factory and then sell to women in urban areas, which then subsidizes pads for women in rural areas. We were honored to win the St. Andrews Prize for the Environment in 2019. Without the generous support and encouragement of the team at St. Andrews, we wouldn't have been able to launch our entire bamboo line of products, as well as our new menstrual cups, grow our team, support thousands more women in rural areas with sanitary pads and menstrual hygiene workshops, and begin working with corporates who are interested in purchasing plastic or carbon credits or pads for their employees. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final of the 2021 St. Andrews Prize for the Environment. 
My name is Tom Brown and I am the Vice Principal for Research and Innovation here at the University of St Andrews and I'm also a member of the screening committee of the St Andrews Prize for the Environment. I'll be leading you through the programme this evening and I really want to extend a warm welcome to you all wherever you are watching us from around the world. We posted the running order for the event in the chat bar where you can send in questions and comments throughout the evening and let us know where in the world you're joining us from. I'm now really delighted to open the event formally by introducing the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of St Andrews, Professor Sally Mapstone. Sally. Thank you very much, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you joining us from further afield. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to the final of the St Andrews Prize for the Environment for 2021. As Professor Tom Brown mentioned, I am Sally Mapstone, Principal of the University of St Andrews, and I'm also a trustee and judge of the prize. This ceremony has a distinct sense of occasion because the last final for the St Andrews Prize took place in February 2020, some 20 months ago. The delay is a result of the pandemic disrupting core operations both for the university and organisations across the world. But it is also because we have used that time to plan for a soft relaunch of the prize and to refine its operational procedures. And I'll speak more on that in a few moments. Let us first consider the context in which we are meeting. At the last prize final, almost two years ago, I said the following. It is increasingly clear that concentrated, informed and sustained efforts must be made to prevent further climate degeneration and to develop preventative measures in response to the destructive effects of the crisis, which can already be felt around us. That comment was made in response to the wildfires, which then raised, raged across an area the size of South Korea on the Australian continent as well as a string of particularly violent storms here in the United Kingdom. The time since then has demonstrated the increasing urgency with which we must address the crisis. The special report published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change this summer has refined, redefined the way we view our natural world through its conclusion that anthropogenic climate change will have significant irreversible impacts, but that the profundity of those changes will depend entirely upon the decisions we make now. The report's publication, alongside a series of freak weather incidents that have touched members of our immediate university community, including this summer's European flooding that adversely impacted colleagues at the University of Bonn, with whom St Andrews has a partnership arrangement, and the extreme rainfall behind the flooding in much of the US Northeast in the past months has viscerally reaffirmed those conclusions. And whilst the pandemic may not be a direct consequence of climate change, we know that it originated as a consequence of how we as humans engage with the natural world. So there is an imperative need to transform our environmental aspirations into action and a social responsibility to support the production of sustainable solutions. The St Andrews Prize for the Environment has been doing just that for 23 years. Since its foundation in 1998, the prize has attracted over 6,000 applicants and has awarded over $2.2 million in prize money to projects that have meaningfully responded to real world challenges in a lasting way. We will see evidence of this in the course of today's event. Veterans of the prize will recognize this as the first year in which it has been hosted independently by the University of St Andrews. And we have approached this as an opportunity further to integrate the prize into our community and to ensure it is engaged with by our staff and our students. The movement of the prize final to October is intended to fit the event more cohesively into the academic year and thus to ensure that engagement is as broad as possible, 
as well as to coincide with the United Nations Climate Change Conference for 2021, which will start in Glasgow at the end of this month. 2021 is also the first year that the prize is being funded through a consortium of donors, comprising a group of alumni and friends of the university based in the UK, the United States and Hong Kong. We are so grateful for their support, which enables us to recognise three exceptional projects tonight. I would also like to take a moment to pay tribute to one particular donor, our alumnus Simon Fraser, who sat sadly passed away in August of this year. Simon, along with his wife Bridget, was a generous supporter and great friend of the university and Simon and his family are very much in our thoughts. Before we proceed, I must also make clear that the coordination and administration of the prize requires year round effort from a great number of people, from colleagues in the university's development office, particularly the estimable Shona Stewart, to the hardworking and committed members of the screening committee and the dedicated and insightful judges and trustees who are so outstandingly chaired by Dr. Hayatin Sillam. You're too many to name in person, but my sincere thanks are with each of you. That financial support for the prize from members of our St Andrews family recognises that sustainability is a value that underscores our collective identity, something which I'll speak more to at the end of today's event. For now, let me hand over to Dr. Hayat and Sillam, Chair of the Trustees of the St Andrews Prize, who will introduce our finalists and take us through the running order of today's event. Thank you all very much for joining us once more. Thank you very much, Sally, and hello, everybody, and thank you all for joining. So as Sally said, my name's Hayat and Sillam, and by day, I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering, but tonight, I'm here as Chair of Judges and Trustees for this very special prize, a role I truly feel privileged to fulfil. The prize final is always a highlight of my year, and I vividly remember the last prize final, which took place in St Andrews in February 2020, as Sally said, just as COVID was starting to come into our consciousness. How much has changed since then? But as Sally has reflected, if anything, the importance of finding innovative solutions to help us live more sustainably on this planet has only grown. Now, I am one of life's great optimists, and whilst, of course, the impact of the pandemic on so many millions of lives and livelihoods has been truly devastating. I cannot help but also reflect on the insight it has given us into what we're truly capable of achieving when we feel we have no other choice. When our ambition is high enough or the imperative is strong enough, ingenuity, creativity, collaboration come together to make the seemingly impossible possible whether that's creating new vaccine platforms from scratch or the coming together of communities to care for the most vulnerable during the most adverse of circumstances. And I can think of no more galvanising or motivating shared goal than our climate crisis and the urgency of the need to move to more sustainable ways of living. In their different ways, our finalists for the prize this year, Snow Change, Cities Without Hunger Brazil and Planet Indonesia, have all taken up that challenge. And we're going to give you all the chance to find out more about them and their work through some brilliant showcase videos for each of our three finalists, following which they're going to join us to answer questions from the audience. So please do have your questions ready. And we're also going to hear from our incredible 2020 winner, Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, who was recently recognised as one of the 100 most influential women in Africa. I am not surprised at all. Gladys, we salute you. We're in for a treat, everybody. And finally, I'd like to say that, well, in some ways, it's a pity, of course, not to be able to gather in person for the final this year as a result of the pandemic. Actually, I think it's very exciting to have the opportunity provided by this online event to share our 2021 finalist stories and the 2020 winner stories with a much wider audience, including, of course, their friends and family. So I hope that you're going to enjoy the evening and I'm going to hand back now to Tom. Over to you, Tom. Many thanks, Hayatun. I'm now really delighted to introduce the first of our finalists, 
Snow Change Cooperative, who are represented tonight by Taro Mustonen. Snow Change Cooperative is a network of indigenous and local traditional communities working on cultural, environmental and science issues. They primarily support programmes in the boreal and in the Arctic to advance indigenous cultural issues and well-being, rewilding and ecosystem restoration, as well as landscape scale restoration of community lands. We'll now play a short video showcasing their work, after which Taro will join us to answer your questions. So I strongly encourage all of you to submit questions in the question bar as the video is playing. Our activities here have to do with landscape rewilding and the notion of trying to advance that kind of work is that there's a huge potential in the northern boreal peatlands, forests, rivers and lakes to come back into health. We are not saying that they are primary habitats, that's of course another story, but the quantity and the scale of damaged ecosystems vouches for a huge potential to rewild and restore habitats that are then safe havens for climate security, biodiversity and for local communities. We are of course tackling a legacy of century of destruction of habitats. Almost 95% of the old growth and natural forests have been lost over the past century in Finland, as well as over 5 million hectares of northern peatlands. Finland doesn't have oil and gas, we are a superpower of peatlands. Unfortunately, so much of those uh, peatlands were ditched, churned and utilized by the industries over the past decades. So it's really that, that mission of trying to restore, rewild and nurture them back into health that's guiding our work. And because of the flyway of many birds, these actions matter also on the global and European level. A lot of the birds come here to nest and uh, have the offspring and that's why we are helping also European level biodiversity as well as water quality and ultimately climate security because we are restarting large amounts of natural carbon sinks. Well, the first and foremost beneficiary of what we do and of our work is of course nature herself. But secondly, we are also having a list of local and indigenous communities that are um, benefiting from all of our work. Essentially, we are handing over all of our rewilded sites back into co-management, co-governance and the use of land, land use and occupancy by the local communities here in the north for their um, traditional activities. And ultimately, we are servicing humanity as well by creating these carbon sinks, biodiversity hotspots in ways that don't generate profits and only uh, happens for non-profit purposes. Rewilding has a tremendous potential to solve the biggest crisis of our time. Actually, two of those crises. A huge solution on restarting carbon sinks and natural carbon trapping so-called nature-based solutions, and also alleviating the biodiversity crisis. No city can survive on its own. It needs the surrounding areas for food security, pollinators, food, water, healthy water, and networks of how food and these other commodities are trans um, transformed and transplanted between systems. And that's why the actions can be upscaled all around the world. More specifically, the peatland restoration could be replicated fast in Sweden, Northwest Russia, Canada, parts of Alaska and here. Let alone in Finland, we have about 5 million hectares that could be worked on today. And that represents one of our best and quickest chances of hope in the fight against climate change uh, in scale and being a very cost effective action. So many ways we have already won 
because out of these amazing delegates and nominations, we have come to a place of being a finalist. And we don't view this as a competition. No matter who one of us three organizations comes and wins, uh, has already tested and shown the quality of their work. First and foremost, I think for our organization, winning or being as a finalist shows that the work that we have done committed on traditional knowledge, cultural heritage and science to rebuild and restore our homelands has value. It's a great source of self-esteem for very remote communities, especially the Sami and the Sami women who are working with us. I have recently been exchanging with one of the, them, Paulina Fyodorov, who is a school Sami leader, and she wrote in a scientific paper that it's the Sami women who feel in their bodies the damages that are happening. If we are in a position to alleviate any of those damages, and heal some of that damage that has taken place, then we are being recognized today not because of our hectares or scientific innovations or commitment to some kind of projects. We are being recognized today for our courage to embrace the unknown and do things that are for the first time alleviating a century of war against nature in these parts. And finally, we are arriving at a peace. <clears throat> Tero, thank you very much for that excellent for that excellent um, video that you've provided for us, and I'd like to welcome you personally to the Prize for the Environment competition. Um, I just want to start with with one question of my own. Um, can you tell us a bit about how um, the relationship between the Sami and the Finnish government um, come into play when you're when you're trying to plan and trying to work on rewilding in Finland around, particularly thinking about areas around land ownership. Taro, can you unmute? Okay, still can't hear. Okay, go ahead, Taro. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> well, here we are at the celebration of the 2021 uh, uh, panelists and the award ceremony. Thank you for this again. And uh, let me go straight into your question. Uh, Finland is standing out in this part of the world and in Northern Europe, unfortunately, because we have not ratified land or water rights for the Sami, unlike, for example, Norway. And that has to do with the specific history that Finns and the Sami share the complex uh, of being a young country and also probably on the long term dependency on boreal pulp and paper industries that have been logging away. Uh, and now when we look at the final remaining forests, they are often in the Sami area. And that's why the contested land ownership is still there and unfortunately so. OK. Thank you for that, Taro. We had a question. We've had a question come in, um, which is that you outline a very convincing case around nature based solutions for climate, people and biodiversity. Uh, what role does your work play towards the contribution to Finland's nationally determined contribution? And what role does the state play in supporting the protection and restoration of these habitats in Finland? Thank you. Um, as such, our rewilding sites and the carbon tally or the things that we are able to save and, and uh, so on is not calculated in the national <coughs> carbon inventories because they happen often on private lands and they are done by an NGO, i.e. ourselves. So it, it's a complementary action that's not included in the national tallies. The way the government is doing their part, of course, starts with the public lands. Um, the state owns the, the uh, <clears throat> governmental lands and they have started some restoration actions on those vast millions of hectares they own. Unfortunately, it's often too little and too late. And that's why the, the uh, urgency would demand 10 times more actions a year 
than they could be doing. Uh, we don't listen, we don't associate with the state. Our program is fully independent. The only link between us and the state has to do with the uh, if we create a formal protected area, then we have to work with them on the legal case and actual statutes of what happens on a site. But otherwise, we are fully independent in our work. OK, thank you. Thanks for that answer, Terry. Um, how do you can you just give us a bit of an outline about how you can work, how you work with the indigenous populations in in choosing where to where to undertake projects and in then developing those projects? Yeah, our benefit is that we are and have been for the past 21 years a community driven process. So there's a steering committee. There is a number of <clears throat> community leaders that are a part of our decision making process. So we don't expand. We don't go out or init initiate anything unless there is a call and invitation from a community to do that. And uh, only after that and after consultation and free prior informed consent with the community will then look what could happen. Um, the case for Finland and the Finnish community of indigenous peoples, the Sami, is um, <clears throat> of course of high priority on our list because the each day the logging of the boreal forests and climate change impacts and other things are proceeding. So you don't have to create a top 10 list the urgency comes, as we said on the video, from the realization of the past damages that have happened. And some of the logic in our work has to do with rewilding and restoring those issues to enable survival for species and humans today. Thank you, Taro. That was a great reply. Um, can you, I a question here from Stuart Munro. Um, can your project do anything to address the problem of methane locked up in permafrost, which is now being released as permafrost defrosts? Yes, indeed. Thank you for that very timely <clears throat> question for the Arctic. Not all people may know that there's a feedback phenomena undergoing in the high Arctic in Siberia, Alaska and Canada. And as, as the question poses, this has to do with the permafrost permanently frozen soils now being melting and releasing methane um, in quantities also from the seafloor in the Arctic Ocean. That's very disturbing. What makes it disturbing is a methane is the fact that methane is a very potent greenhouse gas and there's not much we can do to <clears throat> control that particular sourcing. The action therefore should be devoted <clears throat> in our opinion to those non permafrost habitats and peatlands in the north. Where, <clears throat> where we can do something about the um, climate action. And, and uh, the good news on the methane is that it does dissipate faster than CO2. But uh, only by working mostly on the human world, capturing methane from agriculture and other sources, flaring natural gas events, uh, that's probably the best so solution where we can do that. And we are, we are not able to handle all of it, but we do what we can. Fantastic. Thank you, Taro. And th thanks for that answer. Um, I've got a question coming in from Altia Davis and Nina Laurie from, from our own School of Geography and Sustainable Development. Can you comment a bit about how Sami knowledge is passed, Sami knowledge about peatlands is passed down through generations of older to younger Sami women? Well, let, let's also make it clear that uh, I'm, I'm a Finn and while we work with the Sami a lot, uh, the question of transfer of knowledge and the rights to the knowledge as with all indigenous peoples will always be with those indigenous communities. But I'll just make some observations that I have uh, made in our colla collaborations amongst the, the reindeer herding communities and the fishing and, and women uh, up there or up here, you could say. Um, often it's oral, the transfer of storytelling, visiting family places, for example, Arctic cloudberry picking is something that the women have been using as a mechanism to transfer their specific knowledges and, and uh, sensitivity to the, to the landscape. And this is building on the understanding that many families and many women consider certain parts of their lands, landscape traditionally owned. So there's a customer ownership element there. And for the lack of better term, the women and the landscape essentially become one they belong together 
And then when it happens in a consented and good way, knowledge gets transferred. The storytelling, the place names, the, the deeper elements of uh, what's going on in, the, uh, in that particular part of the world. Fantastic, thank you, Tero. Um, another question came in, which is, um, what do you think are the main challenges for biodiversity con conservation in the coming few years? The changes that are underway, we have to be very honest, are extremely, um, well, I don't even have words for it, and it has been said so many times. I have sometimes tried to outline that the moment where we are is not a technological crisis, it's not an economic crisis, it's not even a political crisis, it's a crisis of the spirit. And that's why the when I don't use this word lightly, but we need some kind of uh, leadership that would include also the wisdom traditions of today's world. The, all of these faith systems, all of the spiritual elements from indigenous peoples have at their core an understanding that humans are not the enemy of nature. And that's the basic understanding we should propagate in order to come back to good relations with our non-human cohabitants. And uh, that's the best one sentence uh, guide I can give. All the other things will flow from that. But first and foremost, we have to reawaken our sensitivity to this moment. And then there are things to be done today, tomorrow, in a year and in a decade. The fight is not over, but it's crucial close to the midnight. Fantastic, Taro. That, that, that's a really, really great and inspirational answer to us, I think. I'm going to ask one final question, which really thinks about how you got to where we are. Which environmentalists have the, the greatest influence on you and, and who do you look to as your role models when you're thinking about developing, developing your ideas and the work you're doing through Snow Change? Well, uh, they said uh, this is the time to do the name dropping. I won't do much of that. I'll do three points. My wife, Kaisu, who leads this organization with me, provides the wisdom that men don't have. So it's to her that I would go and uh, ask and listen carefully. And that's from that dialogue, good decisions will come to. Secondly, the old fishermen that grew and raised me up on the ice. So we, we still have the lake ice and I have spent my life on that ice. People like Oli Klemola, <clears throat> Kalevi Vierka and all these other old people, they guided me and said, son, this is what you have to do, despite the direction of society going completely that way. Now, these are the things you need to do, given on the knowledge that we have given you. And lastly, I'll, I'll mark down a musician that has mattered greatly to me. It's just a personal choice and it's a funny one, but I do recognize the, the music and the the works of, uh, of a contemporary band called Pearl Jam from the US and their leader Eddie Vedder. And we may laugh about it, but we all need musicians and the arts and the culture on those dark hours when we have to face the worst. And I have to give it to Eddie Vedder that he was there in his music, not in person, of course, when we had to face some of the dark things. And, and I really salute, salute that band and their courage and moment in time of what they have done over the past 30 years. Thank you. Taro, thank you. Taro, thank you so much for answering those questions that have come in from our audience and also for the, the inspirational work that, that you are doing with, with Snow Change along with our other finalists today. I think it's you know, it's a lesson to us all really to listen to, to you and, and everyone else talking and I really want to thank you for that. Um, you. We're, we're now going to move on to our second finalist, um, which is Cities Without Hunger Brazil. We're represented tonight by uh, Christian Temp, who is joining us from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, Cities Without Hunger Brazil was founded in 2004 with the aim of reducing poverty and inequality through the introduction of large scale organic agriculture within cities. So Christian will join us after this short video in the same way Tero just has done to take your questions. So please do submit these questions at any time in the chat bar. For now, I invite you to sit back and watch the work of Cities Without Hunger Brazil.
Hi, my name is Christian Temp and I'm a head of projects in Cities Without Hunger. Our NGO seeks to reduce poverty and malnutrition in poor Brazilian communities from urban agriculture. We work mainly in two projects, the urban farms. The, uh, we build large green spaces like this in, in poor areas of the city. Uh, and in these places, we cultivate fruits, vegetables, and greens. Uh, we sold this food in, in these in this poor communities, and the, the, the profits from these this sales become wages for more than 500 workers in 29 big urban farms. Our second project is the garden in schools. We build uh, gardens in public schools uh, to improve the nutrition of school meals because sometimes that is the only meal that the kids have and during all the day. Uh, the students grow and harvest 24 types of food in addition of learning about healthy eating, sustainable agriculture and respect for the environment. Our work seeks to solve problems such as extreme poverty and malnutrition in the suburbs. In Brazil, 50% of the population is made of uh, informal workers. We are in one of the uh, world's most unequal countries in terms of, of uh, rich, poor, uh, rich poor wages. Uh, food is very expensive here and the poor population only have access for cheap industrialized food and this creates serious health problems for the population. Furthermore, the, the extreme poverty caused by the unemployment generates violence in these communities. Our works provides a decent income in these communities, uh, more nutrition and development in these places. Uh, in the long run, this is uh, one of uh, ways so we can reduce poverty. The beneficiaries of our project are more than 500 workers in 29 big urban farms. Uh, their families too are beneficiaries, they, they emerge from extreme poverty and now they have a dignified life and more than 20,000 students uh, from 59 uh, public schools uh, who daily feed in with, uh, with food from the school gardens. In addition, I have hundreds of people that buy food in our urban farms every day. It gives so hundreds of families access to health and cheap food. We can implement this project anywhere in the world. It's one of the actions that we can impl uh, implement for our sustainable cities in the future. Uh, cities need to be supplied by farms close from the spaces where the consumers are. Uh, and this uh, was has the potential to generate millions of jobs for unemployed people. In addition, school gardens could, uh, should be the standard in any school to prevent malnutritional illness and improve students' learning around the world. Our future planning is to continue to expand our project in Brazil and start our work in other Latin American countries. We are already studying the implementation of urban farms in Mexico, Colombia and El Salvador starting 2023. We are sure that this, this job and income option for thousands of people and we want to develop this idea in other countries pledged by social inequality. Being one on, on of the finalists of such prestigious award is for us already a victory. Uh, but winning it for us it will be a confirmation, uh, all, not only for us, but for our beneficiaries, partners, sponsors, and from Brazilian general public, they are viable options and, and definitely reduce social inequality and poverty around the world is possible. Winning this award in a country far away from us like Scotland means that the team of combating social inequalities, generating income in poor communities and sustainable agriculture is an issue that affects all of us anywhere in the globe. Winning this award is a strong message of hope for all the workers, consumers, students, poor communities, that we are not alone in this idea of improving the world. Christian, many thanks for, for that splendid and inspiring video for all of us. Um, we've got a few questions starting to come in. The, the first question I'd like to ask is, can you describe how you encourage healthy eating, given the widespread advertising and emphasis on junk food in Brazil? Hi, how are you, Tom? And thank you for, for, for all the work that you have done to have us here in the prize. It's a huge pleasure for us. Uh, well. We try to address this 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 problem uh, more with these urban farms. Uh, of course, we have the big urban farms and uh, we have the school farms. But we think that uh, if people start to see uh, how we grow the food and in, in the urban farms or in the school farms, they will understand more about the healthy eating because here in Brazil is a complicated question. We are one of the biggest uh, food producers, but in the same time, uh, the poor population are eating even more industrialized food. But if they saw at the schools or at saw at the neighborhoods uh, how they can uh, grow organic food and buy this organic food at cheap prices, 
this uh, this making a learn and a knowledge for them to how uh, uh, engage in healthy eating for them and for their families. OK, fantastic. Thank, thank you, Christian. Can you also can you give us an idea about how this project grew? Where did it start and how did it get to, to where it is now? This project started in 2000 in 2004, many years ago, and uh, did, it was uh, started with a public policy. And after uh, my, my dad started this many years ago, and he, he works for the public city council here in Sao Paulo. But after it's a new was a new project, it's a government project. But when the, the government changed, they they closed this project. But my dad and his workers prefer carry on this project by their own, so they found an NGO, and is working until now. In fact, it was a, a better decision that make it an NGO that. Uh, 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 trying to make this a public policy here because uh, until now the, the governments don't have too much uh, focus on this this these questions. So and for me, I think the United the unification of civil society uh, companies, uh, uh, the private persons, and this is far better than depend on on government policies. So we start so many years ago, and and since we are every uh, every, every year we are growing. That is something really good. Thank you, Christian. Great answer. Um, can, you, can you also let us know, we have a question in here from Simon. Uh, do you have problems with food being stolen from the urban farms? And if so, how do you address this? Well, no, 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 it's not, we don't have, didn't have many cases. Usually these urban farms uh, provide the jobs for this, the people in their neighborhood. So people like to have these farms there. This prevent a lot, this prevent malnutrition. They have food at cheap prices, this generate jobs. And uh, and people like to to go and visit, so we don't have to know too many cases of, of robbery there. Okay, next next question, which has come in, which says, how does the project maintain the health of the soil in the plantations? How do you manage pest control? Well, you, we use natural resources for this I, i'm not a technical i'm not of the technical team to answer you that but uh, we rotate the culture every time maybe people have a harvest so they plant another thing there so this this helps a lot and they use some kind of natural uh, how can i say uh, natural things on the soil so that this this make and this make the the, the the plants get get really really big that is something really interesting because you don't uh, need to use pesticides because the, the we plant and after that we sold this in really in next street so it's this is very the, the produ production area is really close to the consumer areas so you don't have too much problems with this but that's something that we're trying to use most natural uh, uh production is that is possible because we make no no have no reason to to use pesticides and other uh, agrochemical ingredients. Fantastic, and I think that has actually addressed another question which has come in, which was asking about pesticides and insecticides. So one thing I noticed watching the videos is a, a lot of a lot of the work you were showing was filmed sat directly underneath electricity pylons. Um, do you actually have a relationship with the electricity companies and sort of how do you how do you build those relationships and how do you find the space within which to develop your your gardens? Well, first we need to big spaces in urban in urban cities to make these uh, these urban farms. So because we, because we need to produce a lot of food so to pay decent wages for for the people that work there, and then uh, you usually we, you we. Uh, look for for who is the owners of these big spaces. In some cases, this is, uh, is electric companies, and so we offer a project for them. So we take care of the area if you lease this area for us, and of course to have all the security uh, measures. Of course to have no accident. We work with electric companies for more than ten years. So we never have no had no accident there. And so they lease these, these places just because because for them it's really good because the people don't have invasion, is more secure, they can make the, the towers maintenance. So it's a win-win situation for the neighborhood, for us and for the, the electric companies. So we have another question come in now, Christian, which says, um, are you able to revive traditional recipes for cooking the vegetables that you grow? 
how much how much sort of interaction do you have with the users in how they're using your produce as well i guess well most uh, a great part of our or the the beneficiaries they are from traditional communities in other parts of brazil so they bring their their knowledge about this traditional food for for the big cities that is something really interesting and and the people from this poor neighborhood sometimes that most of times in fact they come from this this uh, from the brazilian countryside so they find they find really marvelous when they they find their original food in the big city so then I have a lot of interaction between the beneficiaries, the, the workers and the, the people of the, of the neighborhoods because they understand each other. So they, they know we don't have a specific program for this, but this knowledge are exchange between the, the people and it at the neighborhoods that we when we work. Thanks, Christian. Um, another question that's come in. Have you considered any animal husbandry and expanding this model into animal farming? Mm, now, now, no, you don't have this this for now because uh, uh, breeding animals here in Brazil have a lot of regulations, really complicated thing, and you ha you need to have tons of authorizations for this in, in big cities. So we think that you use these spaces to uh, to grow fruits, vegetables, and and greens. It's more easy, and we can employ more people because. In some case, this is some kind of studies that we have. Some kinds, if you have animal breed, you need to mechanize a lot of things, so it makes no sense because we need to employ more people. This is or or one of our aims. So it's complicated to do that. Well, maybe one day we will have have we already have some studies about uh, growing fish in tanks in the in this this areas, but it's under the study. Okay, th thanks, Christian. Um. Can you tell us a bit about your plans for and how you've expanded across other cities in Brazil? And in fact, how you your plans for taking this idea into other countries in, in South America also? Well, in for other or the this project started in Sao Paulo is the Brazilian biggest city they have the biggest population. So we started in Sao Paulo in Paraná state. Uh, but when you go to another state, you go through partnership with local uh, urban farmers. And this is this is something that is working because we have all the knowledge and uh, but and we teach them how to do that in their states and it's working very, very well. And we, we want to do something like this in the countries that we were trying to go. So we have some have really interesting projects in, in South Mexico and El Salvador and Colombia that we want to develop and they have uh really competent people in these places but these people don't have the money and don't have some parts how the the, the parts of the knowledge how to do it but we have this and uh we are aiming to to work with them and we, because make no sense we are a brazilian country uh, brazilian organization and we don't want to go to another people's country and say them no you need to do this like this no we need to work with them because we and having them there in, in in the field the project will go really really better and it's something that is working in brazil and we are sure that we can do this in other countries thanks christian um some somebody out there he's he's basically he's pretty curious because they want to know what the top three crops are that you actually grow through this approach well, in, in, in Sao Paulo specifically, I know that. I, I don't know in the, the rest of Brazil, but in Sao Paulo specifically, the first is lettuce, uh, tomato, people like a lot, and cucumber, cucumber. <laughs> I don't know if this is not the right name in English, but uh, this is the main. But we, we grow 50, 50, 55 type, different types of food, greens and vegetables. Thanks. Uh, we've got a question now coming in from, from Gertrude, who says, have you encountered any problems with commercial farms who may see you as competition? No, not in Sao Paulo. In Sao Paulo, no, no, not in Sao Paulo, not even in Brazil, because Brazil have a more than 200 million uh, people uh, living here. And this urban farming in Sao Paulo is the most developed uh, city. Uh, it, it's only around 10% of the total uh, food supply of the city. We are not only the, the, the only urban farmers here, but uh, 
but uh, it's still uh, we don't see the, this problem right now. Maybe one day we will have, but we are too much focused in poor neighborhoods and uh, these people don't have access for this more uh, fancy supermarkets. So they, they buy in or in our gardens with really cheap, really cheap prices. And still now we didn't have no problem, but maybe one day we will have. <laughs> Let's see. Fantastic. Um, next question has come in. Um, how is the current political environment in Brazil? Is it a challenge for you and how much of a challenge is it? Well, it, this is the most challenging part these days because uh, uh, we don't have no no public uh, assistance uh, and in Brazil in Brazil we don't have too much uh, support for these poor neighborhoods and now we have probably the worst government on earth about uh, the environment issues and one of the questions here that we are really concerned is about the how the, the normal agriculture is destroying the Amazon ecosystems, Pantanal ecosystems to produce more food for export and our, our population, poor population have nothing to eat, so it make no sense. And our, we, we think this urban, the urban farming is one of the solutions for, for these unemployed, tons of unemployed people here in this crisis, not, not only because of the COVID, but before, we, before the COVID, we are in economic crisis anyway. And uh, it, it's, really, it's really a challenge to work with, no, with, with a government that have a specific policies to destroy the, the, the environment, specifically to destroy, uh, destroy the competition for small farmers. It's really complicated, but in the same time, I'm, I'm have a lot of hope, and I'm seeing uh, the the society are changing, and the young people are not uh, don't want this kind of uh, thing anymore. So, and have a lot of concern and a lot of discussion. So about this, I think I'm I'm really hopeful that we have better days. Great, and I, you know, and one of the things that struck me about your presentation also was working with schools and young people. Can you tell us a bit about how you make those links with those schools and you know and how you pick which schools to work with in your project? Well, this is a uh, this is a, a funny story. Uh, the school garden project became a, a, like a, a baby from the urban farm project because uh, around the, the urban farms have tons of school. Only in Sao Paulo City we have two, more than two thousand public schools. And, and they have a lot of schools near the, the big urban farms. So we start to have a small project with one school and after that became a huge success. Now we have almost 60 schools and, and they like this because they like want spaces for the kids uh, grow, uh, kids and, and young ones uh, grow and, and have some uh, different activities than stay all day at the, the classroom. So they start this and I have another question. Uh, the, Brazil, the Brazilian public schools meals are terrible and they have no nutrition or little nutrition, and this the, and and this these uh, school gardens provide this nutrition, and the kids like to plant, like to harvest, like to participate in irrigation, and it, so it became like a garden for the school and for the community. So and that's something that the schools like, and the community, the parents like, the childrens like. So it's something that is good for everyone. And we never had, since we started this program, a school that made a bad garden or destroyed the garden. When we, we construct this, after that, be, uh, stays forever. So that's something that it's really, really good. And that's, that's great to hear. And th thanks for that, Christian. I'm going to end with, just waiting for the camera to come to me, Christian. <laughs> Don't worry. So I'm going to end with, with a final question, which is the same one I asked at Taro. Who's inspired you on your journey and which environmentalists do you, have you found particularly inspiring and you used as role models in, in developing your ideas? Well, something, another interesting question. Um, I'm already, I've started working with Cities Without Hunger uh, three years ago. I'm, I'm from, from another, I'm from private sector. But when we start to addressing here in Sao Paulo, we have a big social inequality. We have uh, parts like it's like New York, but have parts it's like the poorest country in Africa. And then you start to see this, you see, we need to do some act and do something because the poverty is growing for a lot of years here in Brazil. Uh, we are destroying the ecosystems for different kind of productions or, or agriculture productions. 
And so we, we can't stop and say, OK, this is no more problem. No, this is our problem or problem right now. And I'm starting to, to working with this and after that we can go out because you get so much involved and you see the difference that, that this work do in a lot of people's lives. And, and in the same way, these urban farming are, are changing how you were uh, think and view about the or, uh, how you produce your food and how we produce your food can direct impact uh, in, in the ecosystems and the, in the global warming. So this is something that, it, it, of course, we do a small, really small part of this, but I think our work are making more people paying attention about these issues. And so this is really, really great. And if people have more knowledge that you can do the same thing uh, with another way, in more a healthy way, in a more uh, sustainable way, so in the future, this, this, the things will change. So that's, that's things that inspire me a lot. Fantastic. And thank you so much, Christian. And I think that's, a, that's an absolutely great note to end on. It's been a real pleasure to see the work of Cities Without Hunger in Brazil and the efforts that you and your colleagues are putting into solving, solving the kinds of big problems that you're addressing. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to our third and final finalist. Planet Indonesia, who were established in 2014 and are dedicated to the conservation of at-risk ecosystems through village-led partnerships. Planet Indonesia have pioneered a model of community-based conservation by partnering with local communities living around the remaining vestiges of intact forests and at-risk seascapes in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. After this short video, we will be joined by their executive director, and co-founder Adam Miller, who will be here to answer questions. So again, please submit these questions now and as the video is playing. So over to the video. My name is Adam Miller and I am the executive director and co-founder of Planet Indonesia. We are a grassroots conservation organization that conserves at-risk ecosystems through village-led partnerships. We engage locally-led solutions to put communities back behind the wheel in determining their own social ecological trajectory. We embrace a holistic approach by integrating livelihoods, community health, and education into locally-led governance institutions. Indigenous communities represent just 2% of the world's population, but protect 80% of the world's biodiversity and 25% of the world's carbon stocks. They are the most important stakeholder for the future of our planet and our climate. However, these communities have been marginalized by years of systemic poverty, years of oppression, and colonial conservation that strips them of their rights. At Planet Indonesia, we work to reverse this process, and we start by listening. Listening and responding to needs and opportunities allows us to work effectively and support communities to tackle injustices, improve social economic conditions, and adopt participatory management over natural resources. Planet Indonesia works across both marine and terrestrial environments, and most recently helped communities in Indonesian Borneo secure rights and create the island's largest locally managed marine area. To date, we have established 25 conservation cooperatives, our flagship approach at Planet Indonesia. These cooperatives are providing benefit to over 15,000 individuals who are protecting more than 1.2 million hectares of land and sea. We work primarily with rural farmers and artisanal fisher families to catalyze locally led equitable conservation and community development solutions. Our flagship model has already been adopted by thousands of individuals in West Kalimantan. Currently, there are more communities asking to partner with us than we have funding for. Additionally, other CSOs in Indonesia have requested to build partnerships with Planet Indonesia to adopt various aspects of the conservation cooperative framework. This is evidence that our model is flexible and scalable as a variety of marine, human rights, terrestrial, and development organizations are interested in applying our conservation cooperative framework to better serve the communities they work with and drive sustainable management of natural resources. We believe in actions at scale to meet and combat the scale of the problem that our planet currently faces. Our vision is one of servitude, supporting partners, snowballing impact through networks and advocating for global change through combined and aggregated grassroots efforts. 
We believe in a world where indigenous and local communities are back behind the wheel and determining their own social ecological trajectory. Winning the St. Andrews Prize will be a game changer for Planet Indonesia. It will allow us to expand the locally managed marine area network in West Kalimantan. It will allow us to almost double it in size, partnering with new communities along the coast to continue delivering solutions for oceans and the coastal communities that depend on them. Moreover, it will also provide critical funding to support six local NGOs on five other islands across Indonesia to drive the adoption of community-led best practices and build a network of organizations fighting for global change. Tom, you need to unmute. Adam, thank you very much for that inspiring video, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the University of St Andrews for the for the for this final tonight. Um, I just wonder if you could begin a little bit by telling us about the challenges that you have about um, trying to you do marine conservation areas within Indonesia and how they sit within the sort of legislative and government frameworks that you're trying to work within Indonesia. Adam, you also need to unmute, just as I needed to unmute. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. OK, sorry about sorry. that. Can you hear me now? It says I'm still muted. No, we can hear you loud and clear. OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, once again, thank you so much to everyone at the St. Andrews team for this uh, amazing opportunity today. So yeah, the challenges that we face for marine conservation in, um, it's asking me to unmute again. I'm sorry, is it unmuted? We can hear you, Adam. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, they're vast in nature. And I think that one of the greatest challenges that we're currently facing is that compared to our work in terrestrial ecosystems, that currently marine policy in Indonesia doesn't offer clear pathways for communities to secure rights over ocean resources. So I talked about in the video that we've created the largest locally managed marine area on uh, the island of Borneo, the world's third largest island in the world. Um, and the way that we actually went about doing that was securing rights through a social forestry scheme over mangrove forests. And then for the fisheries that were found in and around those mangrove forests, we were able to list them as non-timber forest products in order to build the locally managed marine area. So that's one of the main challenges that we face compared to some of the other countries in Southeast Asia or even Africa like Madagascar that offer clear policy pathways for communities to secure rights. Um, I think some of the other challenges that we face are that so much of conservation and development still seems to op operate in silos. Um, the communities that we work with in, in rural mangrove areas, as well as rural terrestrial areas, um, are faced with a number of challenges when it comes to securing rights, access to healthcare, education, livelihoods, microfinance, startup capital, and all these things. And so it's really important for conservation to not operate in a silo and to integrate and, and embrace a holistic approach. Um, and that's a main value of Planet Indonesia. And we feel that for the global South particularly, really needs to become the new norm and how we operate, whether that be organizations directly providing a breadth of services that are holistic in nature or providing those services to part uh, through partnerships with other organizations. Thanks, Adam. Great answer. Um, the next question we've got is, can you give an example of how biodiversity has been protected as a result of your activities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a great question and it's a hard one because it's it's there's many ways to measure it. Um, and as an NGO, we'd always like to be measuring more. But I think in terrestrial, I'll think of use two examples. In one of our terrestrial sites, one of the flagship species that we work with is the helmeted hornbill. It is a critically endangered species and its cask is worth five times the price of elephant ivory on Asian black markets. Um, so it's extremely endangered uh, and in our terrestrial site through a number of community-based programs, including the flagship conservation cooperative approach, but also having a nest protection program and a number of other activities. Over the past five years, we've seen the density of the species increase from 1.54 individuals per kilometer squared to 2.68. Um, it's one of the only places on the island of Borneo where the species is not decreasing, much less increasing. 
in the locally managed marine area, which is mostly a mangrove habitat that we work in. It's home to the uh, endemic and endangered proboscis monkey. And over the past four years, we've seen the detections through smart patrols. So detections being a detection per kilometer patrolled. Um, increased by 36%. Um, and there's a number of other indicators as well, but I think that those two ones are kind of key species that, that are talked about a lot these days in kind of mainstream conservation. And in our project sites, we're seeing them stabilized um, and, and slightly improving in density as well. Fantastic, Adam, and, th and thanks for that answer. And as a university, you know, we're really interested in measurement in biodiversity and have got, you know, considerable expertise. So I'm sure there are a lot of interested people in the audience tonight from the biodiversity population as well. Um, the next question comes in from Stuart Munro, who asks you just to outline a bit about what your current funding sources are for the charity. Um, yeah, they're, they're quite diverse in nature. Um, we receive some support from US foundations. I could name a few like the David Lucille Packard Foundation, March Conservation Fund, a few others, as well as the US government, uh, the US State Department through the Great Apes Fund has been a great supporter and ally of ours. Um, the UK has actually been a really amazing support agent. So we're um, one of the smallest organizations to ever win a full Darwin Award through the Darwin Initiative. And last year we were also the only kind of non big NGO to win the Illegal Wildlife Trade Cha uh, Challenge Fund. Um, and most recently we've uh, secured funds from the German government through the Blue Action Fund, which is helping us scale up our marine work moving out from mangroves and nearshore fisheries to an offshore marine protected area as well. Okay, thank, thanks, Adam. And um, the next question comes from Moira Sharkey, who asks, do you see the conservation cooperatives model being used in other island communities? And how do you transfer those outside Indonesia? Um, we, yes, we are. So that's one of the current areas that we're working, um, is to work on five other islands in Indonesia, Sumatra, uh, Bali, Lombok, uh, uh, Ende or Endete, and then Sulawesi, Central, South and North Sulawesi. Um, to help communities adopt the conservation cooperative approach, but by working with local organizations. So a big value of Planet Indonesia is having those local connections and intimate relationships with the communities that we work with and serve. And since our organization is based on the island of Borneo and is made up of, of almost entirely indigenous individuals from the island of Borneo, um, we feel that in working in other islands of in, in Indonesia, it's important for us to not replicate ourselves, but rather scale through partnerships. Um, how can we support partnerships, aggregate partners in networks, support community exchanges um, to really build this movement around best practices in community-led conservation. Okay, thanks Adam. And in, in answering that question, I think you've also managed to answer another question which had come in from Vic Mohan, which was around the potential for scaling that model. Um, mm -hmm. I want to jump to a question now from, from Bill, who lives in our own coastal community of Anstruther, a bit further down the coast here, who says, um, building and supporting community partnerships is highly commendable work. Where do these stakeholder groups sit in the wider context of environmental governance and how do they leverage change within the legal frameworks of Indonesia? Mm, absolutely. Um, can you all still see me? My, the whole screen's just gone bright yeah, white. Yeah, we, we can see you and hear you. I can't see anything. Yeah, it's just bright white, so it's a bit strange. But um, that's a really great question. And so um, one of the things that we've developed with the conservation cooperative approach is that it is a community based organization and it stands independent of village government. And this is really important for us because village government in Indonesia is quite a complex system um, and there often is corruption that is both from provincial governments to village governments and vice versa. And so a cooperative really is a democratic community based organization. It's made up of members of the communities. They have working groups um, that are centered around different issues like restoration or forest management, and they also have their own elections. Um, so these cooperatives will elect a president, a vice president, and then leaders of these various working groups. So they are within the village landscape. Um, they are independent of village government, although they coordinate quite regularly with village government and other institutions within that level. 
if you kind of are zoom out a bit farther, so if we move up to think about provincial level, um, or so like all of West Kalimantan, um, we've aggregated these cooperatives and networks, and so various cooperatives will conduct community exchanges. So in a simple example of this is one of the cooperatives that we're working with has built a really vibrant uh, stingless bee livelihood program. And because it's gone so well um, and has really helped become an alternative livelihood for a lot of community members, this cooperative is serving as a mentor towards other cooperatives. And so these community exchanges are really important for us because it's a way that we can simply as an organization be a facilitator of a process, but communities are exchanging and sharing knowledge and building um, kind of a movement around some of these areas that we're working in. And then if you kind of zone further out, um, when we talk about national level policy and, and, and things like that, what we're actually seeing is the conservation cooperative approach now being adopted and supported by national government. Um, and so one of the things that's in the works, which would be a huge win for us, is the uh, provincial government in West Kalimantan is lobbying the central government that every single protected area in Indonesia should have conservation cooperatives in their buffer zones as a way to engage communities and natural resources, uh, natural resource management rather. So it would quite literally be scaling this approach um, that we're using in about five major landscapes or major protected areas um, to the entire country. Okay, thanks, thanks, Adam. Um, we've got a question from John Vickery. Um, just briefly, where do you see yourself and Planet Indonesia heading over the next five years? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so I think you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, Planet Indonesia, because we value. Um, being nested in the landscapes and communities that we serve, that Planet Indonesia itself really will just have direct field programs on the island of Kalimantan or Borneo. And that's what we feel is most representative of the values and principles of our organization. However, we are interested in this idea of delivering solutions at scale. Um, and to do that, we're looking at scaling via partnerships. So how can we identify other great civil society organizations or community groups or other entities that have similar values to Planet Indonesia and are nested in the landscapes or seascapes and communities that they're serving? And how can we provide technical assistance, startup funding, um, and also learn from them because we're a big advocate that we have as much to learn from partners as partners have to learn from us. And then kind of step two of, of that process is again building these networks. So how can networks of organizations that embrace these values and principles and embrace these best practices in community-led conservation advocate together in Indonesia and beyond and try to drive global change and advocate for a human rights-based approach to conservation on a global scale? Thanks, Adam. Um, next question is, uh, once your initiatives have started, do you have evidence they're self-sustaining or do you need to keep supporting these local communities? Absolutely. So um, what the kind of rough target that we have in our head, um, and I, I wish I could show you a graph, but it kind of decreases over a five year period. So between one year one and year three, um, we're generally supporting and facilitating a lot, um, both financially and also our staff are quite frequently in the field and helping troubleshoot problems, build standard operating procedures and compliance factors. But what we see is from year four or five and onwards that we really are just there as a facilitator to sometimes help solve problems, but the financial curve decreases. And so actually one of the backstories of Planet Indonesia is that we are created the organization to scale up and replicate the conservation cooperative approach who one of our co-founders, Novia Sagita, created in 2000. She created a cooperative to empower indigenous women to revitalize traditional textiles, um, which is a form of art and material culture for the Dayak, the indigenous group of Borneo. She started that cooperative with 20 individuals and it's grown to over 1,500 in uh, serving over 60 villages. And that cooperative has become completely self-sufficient since 2008. So within eight years, um, they have their own management structure. They're no longer reliant on outside funds and basically through their savings and loans work and selling their products that they are become a completely self-sustained cooperative. Um, and so Planet Indonesia was actually really created to take that approach and grow it uh, and replicate it and test it in a number of different systems, uh, ecos uh, ecosystems, both terrestrial and marine. OK, thanks, Adam. Um, a question from Katie. What led you to Indonesia and getting involved in this in with Planet Indonesia? Yeah, for my uh, my story is actually uh, I'm an ornithologist by training, so I was a bird lover. Um, and I had always dreamed of studying tropical birds and I, I moved to Indonesia in 2012-2013 uh, uh, to study birds. And 
I guess you could say I had an early life crisis. I was out in a forest um, doing transects, counting birds, and all day long you could hear chainsaws and rifles. And I was living in an indigenous community for over a year during that time. Um, and it was really that experience is when I learned the facts and learned the stories. And so I like to tell people that I hung up my binoculars um, and decided to become <laughs> a social entrepreneur and look at other ways to do conservation that are people centered. Um, and so it was around that time that I first was introduced to the four co-founders of Planet Indonesia who are all from the island of Borneo. And we all were coming from different places, some from other NGOs, a few from governments. One was a teacher, um, one was a fiction writer. And we really put our heads together and, and tried to think about what is missing? What's Why is it not working in Indonesia? Um, and even though community-based conservation is something that's talked about and it's kind of the norm, so much of it fails. Um, and it was really those early stories and going out and listening to communities, listening to rural communities in coastal areas, listening to montane communities in the interior of Borneo. Why did individuals feel like they had to sell their land to oil palm companies, engage in illegal logging or wildlife trade or illegal fishing? And the organization was built around those stories. Um, and it just so happened, of course, as I said earlier, that one of our co-founders had developed and piloted this really amazing cooperative model. And so we took that model and took the stories that we heard, and that's how we built um, Planet Indonesia. Fantastic, Adam. And I think that's probably as good as good a way to end this, this set of questions. I just want to thank you um, for the great, great video and the great question and answer session. Um, and also, also pass on our thanks to your partners at Planet Indonesia um, in doing this. Yeah, they are the heroes, so thank you so much. I'd now like to just to thank all of our finalists um, and also thank the audience who are out there for such interesting questions that have led a really thought provoking discussion around the three projects that we've seen today. Um, we will be announcing who the trustees have chosen as the winner of the 2021 St Andrews Prize for the Environment at around 7 p.m. So that's in about 45 minutes time. Um, but before then, I have the real pleasure of introducing um, Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka of Conservation Through Public Health, who won the St Andrews Prize in 2020 for their project Integrating Gorilla and Community Health. Conservation Through Public Health was founded on the belief that conserving wildlife must go hand in hand with the support of neighbouring communities. Applying a unique One Health approach, their vision and, in and innovative their vision and innovation bridges, synergizes and integrates approaches addressing three of the world's greatest priorities, biodiversity conservation, health advances and livelihood improvements for local communities. In doing so, amazingly, they've almost doubled the number of mountain gorillas in Uganda. In her presentation tonight, Gladys will discuss with us how winning the St Andrews Prize has enabled conservation through public health to extend their One Health model now to the Eastern Lowland Gorillas in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She'll also touch on how the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has affected conservation efforts. And after the presentation, Gladys will join us for questions. So again, please do submit questions during the presentation through the chat bar. For now, I would just like to introduce uh, Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka and her presentation on uh, Inter integrating guerrilla and community health development. Over to you. Thank you very much, St Andrew's Prize for the Environment, for inviting me back. It was a very good honour to win the prize in 2019. I travelled over to St Andrew's with Alex, our community health and conservation coordinator at Windy. And it was a truly amazing experience. It was actually Alex's first time to ever travel out of the African continent. And we learned a lot from the web seminars, meeting everybody. And I'm very happy to come back today, although it would have been better to come physically, but to be able to talk about the work that we've done since getting the support from the St. Andrew's Prize for the Environment. Um, during that time, I've been greatly honored to win the 2020 Aldo Leopard Mammalogist Award. That was in August 2020. And this year in August, I've been really honored to be one of the 100 most influential women in Africa, according to advanced media list. 
it's a great honor because on this list are many women doing amazing things around the world, um, including Ellen Jensen Salif, who made me a COVID-19 heroine. Um, however, very few of us are in the environment sector. There's me and Dr. Musonda, who works with UNEP. Mountain gorillas are endangered. I'll start off by talking a little bit about giving a background of what we do. Um, I've been working with the mountain gorillas for over 25 years, and I've been pleased to say that during this time, the numbers have increased. They used to be critically endangered, but now they've been struck off the critically endangered list because of the positive growth trend. However, there's only just over 1,000 left in the world. When I first started working with them, there were about 600, but now there's just over 1,000. So though their numbers have almost doubled over the past 25 years, there's still very, very few in number. And this particular gorilla called Kanyoni is one of my favorite gorillas. Ever since I started working with the gorillas, basically he was born during that time. And I saw how having a, such a gorilla that's grown up seeing people all his life, what it does for the community as well, because tourists enjoy watching him, people pay money to visit the gorillas and their local communities benefit. The mountain gorillas are found in two distinct habitats, Bwini Pentobo National Park and the Virungas. And in between there's very high human population growth. And that's another issue that even if the numbers are going up, there's not much space for them to go. They are mainly threatened by habitat loss. Um, it's a very hard edge when you come to Bwini Pentobo National Park. It's even worse in DRC and Rwanda. It's a very hard edge. And that means that gorillas can go out, although they shouldn't. They don't know that they're not supposed to because it sometimes used to be part of their former range. But people, you find that people can also go in illegally or legally. And all of this threatens the gorillas directly or indirectly, but also helps to conserve them. Unfortunately, we got a scabby skin disease outbreak in the mountain gorillas in 1996 and 2000, which was traced to people living around the park who have very little health care. That time I was working as the first vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And this made me realize that you can't really protect the gorillas without improving the health of the people. And the gorillas, when they went out to eat people's banana plants, they caused a lot of conflict. And this is possibly where they picked up the disease because people put dirty clothing on scarecrow to chase away gorillas, baboons, and other wildlife. The gorillas are also threatened by poaching, mainly in all the other countries where they're found. DRC and other countries. In Uganda and Rwanda, it's not such a big issue because people culturally don't eat gorilla meat. In Uganda, the Batwa hunter-gatherers who lived in the forest believe that if you eat a gorilla, it's a big taboo. If you look in the eyes of a gorilla, it's a big taboo. But they get caught in snares set for dika, bush pig. And unfortunately, during 2020, one of the gorillas was speared by a bush meat poacher. In Windy. So at CTPH, we keep the gorillas and other wildlife healthy and their habitat secure. Actually, in this forest of Windy, when you come to visit us one day, I hope, the team from St. Andrew's tries, you notice that um, you see this beautiful view from our office. It's lovely to have such a nice office view. But inside this forest, when you protect the gorillas, there are also other very important species. There's elephants, there's chimpanzees, there's a number of different species of monkeys, there's over 300 species of birds, and there's many several species of butterflies. On top of the forest being an important water catchment area for the communities. And so by protecting a charismatic species like the gorilla, you're hoping to keep its habitat intact and all, every, all the other wildlife is kept safe. So uh, we promote biodiversity conservation by enabling people to coexist with gorillas and other wildlife to improving their health and livelihoods. And we use three integrated programs, wildlife conservation, community health, and alternative livelihoods, which I'll talk about in my presentation. And in, we've been carrying out comparative disease investigations since 2005, where we look at diseases in the gorillas, the people, and the livestock. And this is the second center we built with funding from Task Trust. And we host students who come and study what we're doing and also do their research at the same time. So that's another founder member, Stephen, teaching to stu vet students from 
UK and US. And we carry out a loss of behavior change communication to get people to prevent disease between people and gorillas, and especially when they come to their gardens. We train village health and conservation teams. This is the government health center where happily half of them are men and half are women. And they give talks about how to prevent disease between gorillas and people. And at the same time, how to have a bit better health and well-being. And they give permanent planning injections to those who prefer to get an injection in the comfort of their own homes. And we keep, we sustain them with group livestock projects, which keep them going because they're volunteers. They're actually community health workers who the government recognizes, but doesn't pay a salary. And we teach them to also do conservation work and we sustain them with group livestock income generating projects. And we're pleased that because of these interventions, we've contributed to the increase in the mountain gorilla population. And in blue is the Brindy population where we're mainly working and we're glad that it's showing a positive growth trend. Some of the main things that CTPH has done is that gorillas are better protected on community land. People uh, tolerate them more because we're improving their well-being, their health and well-being. There's a very great increase in hand washing facilities. There's reduced disease outbreaks in the gorillas. Um, we haven't had other scabies outbreaks and very little jadia. The women on family planning has tripled more than the national average. And women are more involved in conservation and men in family planning, which is a good thing. We also started to con sustain conservation beyond tourism through alternative livelihoods, through a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise where we train the coffee farmers to grow and process good coffee and give them a bad market prices for the coffee. And a donation goes to support the work of CTPH. Our main customers have been tourists along the tourist trail. And this is the Entebbe duty free shop where people buy coffee on their way out of the airport. And this is a, a very famous cafe at the equator, which also helps AIDS orphans and many, and they're one of our biggest customers. Through our approach, we are able to address many of the sustainable development goals. Um, the main ones that we're addressing are, you know, re reducing poverty, hunger, good health and well-being, gender equality, and also through the coffee, we're promoting responsible consumption, and of course, life on land and partnership for the goals. So the funding from St. Andrew's Prize for the Environment has enabled us to expand this model to another gorilla habitat, and through advocacy to other biodiversity hotspots. And I look forward to talking to you about that. However, I have to say that we were disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. As soon as we left St. Andrews in February, end of February, 2019, we got to Uganda. And I think shortly after that, COVID got to UK. And on the 21st of March, COVID got to Uganda. And this disrupted everything. And we believe it came from the Wuhan wet light market. That's what the greatest evidence is showing at the moment. And a place where there's very little welfare and you know, wild animals, bats are kept in cages next to chickens, next to pangolins and other species. And it's strongly considered that it's a bat coronavirus, but the intermediate host has not yet been determined. But just as COVID likely jumped from animals to people, it can also jump back from people to animals as we've seen with the scabies and other disease outbreaks into the great apes. So human chromant flu viruses have affected great apes. Um, in Rwanda, there's a metanoma virus. In Uganda, the rhino C virus, the chimps. And in Albury Coast, they actually got a mild form of coronavirus. And at the beginning of the pandemic, papers started coming out showing that humans, great apes, and other old world primates have the same protein receptors making them highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19. And sadly, this year, captive gorillas in San Diego Zoo and Prague Zoo got COVID from asymptomatic keepers. And the severe one had to be, severe silverback had to be treated with monoclonal antibodies. It's a very expensive treatment, otherwise he was not going to get better. And just last month, captive gorillas in Atlanta Zoo contracted COVID from a vaccinated keeper, um, the Delta variant. And it just shows that we need to you know, now they're going to vaccinate. They've vaccinated, started to vaccinate animals in zoos. And so it's, there's so much, the outbreak keeps on unfolding and we have to keep being stricter and stricter. But one thing that we noticed is that the gorillas in, for tourism are very susceptible to picking up COVID 
just like they've picked up other diseases because they're allowed to get very close. People can get very close to them within seven meters. Over here are tourists are in, using the same, the proper seven meter distance after they've received their briefing, but very often, in fact, almost all the time, as the gorillas got more and more habituated to people and tourism grew over the years, it was almost every time tourists and gorillas got closer than seven meters. In fact, as close as less than three meters. 60% of the time the tourists broke the rules, 30% of the time it's the gorillas who got too close. And so we, in March 2020, we held uh, workshops to prevent disease transmission between how to, to educate rangers on how to train rangers on how to prevent disease between the tourists and the gorillas and got together with all these partners to hold the training. And during, because of this training, we upgraded great breeding guidelines in Uganda, where now everybody has to wear a mask, which is really important because now it's becoming so much more of an issue. And we now take temperatures before people go into the forest. Hand washing and boot disinfection now became mandatory. And now when tourists come, they're actually demanding that they don't make the gorillas and chimps sick and they're very willing to wear masks. We've had to tell vaccinated tourists that they also have to wear masks, but it's now become the new norm and the government, the wildlife authority increased the distance from seven meters to 10 meters. We also trained human gorilla conflict resolution teams of volunteers who had gorillas back when they come out. And we also got together with the village health and conservation teams, the model that we're scaling up to DRC and added COVID-19 to what they're doing to prevent disease transmission. We continue to promote good hygiene and sanitation. Thankfully, during the outbreak, people responded well and the number of hand washing facilities went up, which is very good. We also promote, continue to promote family planning. Um, we focused a lot on homes visited by gorillas and raised awareness on zoonotic disease because of COVID support from our cousin Solidaridad. And uh, with gorilla and forest conservation, it was very much like, even if tourists are not coming, please don't poach because if you poach, the gorillas are going to suffer and we need their own natural heritage. So that was the message that kept coming across. So we trained, we gave, we trained the village health and conservation teams in all these measures. Because CTPH is doing one health work, we're allowed, even if they're not allowing other organizations to go out to do any work, during the lockdown, we were considered essential health, essential workers, and we could go out and carry out these very necessary trainings to the communities. Unfortunately, a, a gorilla got poached during the crisis, got speared by a bushmeat poacher who was hunting dike and bush pig. This is Rafiki, the head of the group. It was very, very sad news, which went all over the world. And when we went to check on Rafiki's group one month later, they had started to settle down, but they were now being headed by a black buck, who was a jet silver. And the porter who took me to the gorillas was one of the few people who got and the living in August of 2020, because he could actually take me to the gorillas. All of them were not earning a living, but it was very nice that he was wearing a mask in memory of Rafiki. So some commun most community members were very upset by what happened. But however, as long as you have people who are poor and desperate, the poaching is going to continue. And when we visited the poacher's wife, we found that she's one of the poorest of the poor with three children mm -hmm. under the age of three. The poacher was given 11 years in jail, which is the longest anyone has ever been given for killing a wild, wild animals in Uganda. A victory for conservation, but how do we keep communities going? So we did something that we don't, we had never thought of doing in our model. Um, we started to provide food relief, but rather than make it like giving people food rations, we focused on giving them fast growing seedlings so that they can go back to agriculture, which they had abandoned for tourism. They have become so dependent on tourism. We thought that our model was an amazing model that can work very well, but COVID-19 showed us that, hey, when there's no tourism, it's very difficult to keep the people and the gorillas healthy and their habitat secure. And so we started, the, we put up this nursery at CTPH and were able to distribute fast growing seedlings to over a thousand people. And we want to continue to do this. We went for the most vulnerable people, including the poacher's wife, whose husband is now in jail. So through the St. Andrew's Prize for Environment, we're able to strengthen the village health and conservation team model in the Virungas, where we had started it, but it was on and off, on and off. But with this funding, we're able to continue working. 
It was very, very difficult to work though, because the borders have basically um, been closed, even between Uganda and DRC. And that's just another reason why poaching increased in Uganda, because people put up their gardens in DRC and they couldn't go back to harvest. We're able to support the coffee farmers, um, replicate the model to one other gorilla habitat and a different subspecies, and virtually share the model with stakeholders in gorilla and other wildlife habitats. And I'll talk about that in detail. So when we presented, we talked about strengthening the network in Virungas and DRC and starting the gorilla conservation coffee model. It was very difficult to do anything for about six months because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so even global, there was just as there were lockdowns around the world, there was local lockdowns in countries where people couldn't move around. But we still felt that because of our One Health approach to conservation, we were best placed to do something about mitigating the impact of the pandemic. Even in DRC, where when it was very difficult for us to go and do anything. So we worked with the staff from local health centers who we had worked with before and got them to send them funds. They bought masks they, for the communities. They taught them, they emphasized on hand washing in the community health workers who work around the gorilla habitats. And they were able to do a lot of work. This is Gato from the health center next to Mikema sector. The masks were all made by somebody in Goma with the logo of CTPH and the health centers. And this was something that really helped the communities because they were not actually getting this training from their country. And it was very important for our team, especially that interact to gorillas to receive this kind of training. So the model in Mount Shiburimu also strengthened. This is further north of Virunga National Park. And Jean-Marie Kambale is over there, was giving a presentation and training the local community volunteers, village health and conservation teams in Mount Shabirimu. And they also at least were able to be more equipped to handle COVID-19 and to prevent COVID-19 between themselves and from people to gorillas. And then we were able to support the farmers, you know, during, before the COVID-19 pandemic, we had our gorilla conservation cafe in Tebe just always buying their coffee, but now we couldn't operate for two months because of the local lockdowns. And no tourists were coming to Uganda, so it was very difficult to support the farmers. We were very glad to get a buyer, a new buyer in the UK, Manuro Beans. This is Vicky, she's based in Maidenhead. She was able to buy coffee from us, which was fantastic. And she placed like, she's placed eight orders since May, 2020. And this kept coffee farmers out of the park and less likely to poach which is very, very important. We also got a new buyer in Kenya, Safari Lounge, and then the New Zealand and the US buyers reordered again in January this year. So we found that we can't just depend on tourists to keep, to sustain conservation or to cover and reg a revenue for coffee farmers. We need to go beyond Uganda. And this is something that's continuing, gonna continue even after the pandemic has ended. So at least in the absence of tourism, some people in the communities Gwindi were able to earn a living. We replicated the model to one other gorilla habitat. This is Maiko National Park. We thought we'd go to Kahuzi Biega over here, but we didn't have enough um, local connections there. And the warden who used to work in Itombwe up here was moved to Maiko National Park. It's called John Paul Chungu. And so we decided let's just work in Maiko, um, where they also have a very big stronghold of Eastern lowland gorillas. The mountain gorilla is only endangered, but all the other gorilla subspecies, the eastern lowland is critically endangered still, so is the western lowland, so is the cross river, because even if eastern lowland numbers are higher than mountain, they're going down because there's a lot more poaching, literality, hunting, killing, and all those kind of things. And so it was very important to see how we could scale our model in those areas. So Michael uh, Chungu, John Claude Chungu, and Jean Marie, the health professional, we work with at Mount Shabirimu, train the rangers in how to prevent COVID-19 between themselves and from the people to the gorillas, which is very important, just like we had done in Windy. And then they also train the village health and health teams, the community health workers, to prevent COVID amongst themselves, get people to wash their hands more often, put up hand washing facilities. So training was held in Michael National Park. Um, one thing I can say though, they only had three women and 37 men. <laughs> so the gender part has not, has, was not able to be accomplished as well, 
but hopefully it's going to keep improving as we go along, as it was in Uganda. So Chingu and Jan Marie train these people in Maiko National Park. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to host a study tour at Windy with key stakeholders, but because of the lockdowns all over the world, it's, it's been impossible. It's been impossible to do anything like this. We just had a very severe second wave in Uganda. The first one was in November, December, where we started to lose people. In the second one, we actually lost someone very dear to our organization. He opened our very first workshop we had with stakeholders to launch the organization. It's called Dr. Steven Sebude. He was the district health officer of Kanulu district. He was one of the first victims in the second wave. He died in June. And just a few days after he had given permission for us to go and train the village health teams, how to continue preventing COVID, the village health and conservation teams between people, and, between themselves and between people and gorillas. And shortly after that, the government then asked us to help to set up village COVID task force teams, where we managed to get the Uganda Wildlife Authority on there and the porters who carry to risk luggage to the gorillas. They're all part of this one health team which is making sure that COVID is managed and mitigated amongst the people and within the people and the gorillas. So that's a very important thing that we're working with them on. And um, we've actually shared the model with stakeholders. Um, we, whatever we did at Windy, we shared, we gave, we've given numerous presentations all through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, something else that we're doing is testing the people and the gorillas for COVID and making sure they're not, you know, they're, they're, the peop, everybody's attended to, people are safe and healthy. And that's another thing that we're doing. And just to make sure that the gorillas don't pick up COVID from people. We, we wrote a policy brief. We joined the Africa CSO Biodiversity Alliance, which is created during the pandemic, because we all couldn't get together to have the conference. And when we told them about our work at CTPH, they encouraged us to write a policy brief, which we wrote with International Gorilla Conservation Program. And it's geared towards government, donors, and tour companies to get people to respect the great eight viewing rules. You know, wear masks, don't get close. Um, try and avoid this thing of, I'm coming to visit great apes. I have to have a selfie with them. I have to get really close. Try and avoid all that because we can end up, you know, destroying and killing the very animals that are then helping to lift people out of poverty and enabling conservation to thrive. We also, teamed up with the University of Exeter, who developed uh, and developed an education campaign to protect great apes from disease. And when you visit this website, you see all the messages that came across. And this was focusing much more on the tourists and funded by the Darwin Initiative. Well, I'd like to thank you so much, St. Andrew's Price for the Environment, for enabling us to do some work, to make an impact, even though it was very difficult to do much during the pandemic because of travel restrictions. But the COVID-19 pandemic strengthened our one health approach at CTPH. And even though that prize money was mainly for scaling up to Virungana, to scaling up to DRC, to our Eastern lowland gorillas, which are another gorilla subspecies, it, we tried to do as much as we could um, in the circumstances. And we are glad for the encouragement we got. Thank you so much for inviting me to write a blog. Shona invited me to write a blog and which was featured on the St. Andrew's Prize uh, platforms uh, about the work we're doing about mitigating the impact of the pandemic. But we realized that over the years, we had developed a model that could, also, that could really help to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. So it's been an opportunity to talk about this model. And thank you so much for enabling us to scale it up to DRSC, even during the pandemic, which was very difficult to work across countries and within countries. And for more information, please visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And yeah, the pandemic has been a very interesting time. I also want to mention that we had, uh, uh, my son managed to write a book <laughs> about working with, with uh, a zookeeper for the week over there. And my mom launched her book last week. She's, uh, I've also taken her to the gorillas. So there's been a lot that's happened during the pandemic, but we're hoping that things will improve. One thing we've done at CTPH is advocated for the rangers, the park staff, the people working with gorillas and great apes to be among the first to be vaccinated. And that has happened. And we want to just keep doing what we can as we navigate these difficult, turbulent times. Thank you so much.
I'd just like to say thank you very much to uh, Dr. Ziku Soka for that fantastic presentation. Gladys, you know, we really appreciate the work that you've done with taking forward what you did after you won the St Andrews Prize. And really, it's fascinating to see the intersection between your work and, and the effects of the pandemic and seeing how those have come together really in a time of great difficulty for us in the world, but seeing your One Health approach really really enabling the health of communities and of the gorillas themselves. You know, so I'd just like to pay tribute to you and your whole organisation for the work that you've undertaken in the course of the last 18 months. Um, now it's time to ask some questions. Um, so the first question we have in is from um, uh, Dr Wilbur Sabiti, who is from our own School of Medicine here in St Andrews, um, who wanted to ask really, um, as well as talking about your excellent conservation work in the part of Uganda he knows well and holds dear, apart from the public health aspects of your work, is there effort and opportunity to engage primary and secondary school children in these kinds of conservation activities? Yes, there is. Um, thank you so much for inviting me back. We do work with primary and secondary schools. Um, we help to set up kids leagues in the school. We teamed up with somebody who started Kampala Kids League, which eventually became the Kids League. And what we do is we trick kids to learn about conservation and public health through sports. So in order for them to win the game, they also have to pass the quiz. And through this, we've been able to engage eight schools around Windy Penetrable National Park and the areas where tourists in interact a lot and where gorillas are always going outside the park. So yes, we are engaging school children. During the pandemic, of course, schools have been closed for almost all the time, and it's been a lot harder to do anything with school children, but we do generally engage them at CTPH. Okay, fantastic. Um, many thanks for that. So my next question, which comes from me is, looking forward, how do you see yourselves moving on beyond the pandemic? I understand that the effects of the pandemic may be long lived in across the world, but what's the vision for moving forward and how do we do you move out of this situation, if you like? Ah, oh, very difficult question. <laughs> very difficult question to answer, but I would say that there are some lessons that we've learned from the pandemic. One lesson we've learned is that conservation was over dependent sustaining conservation was over dependent on tourism. The pandemic clearly showed that, you know, before the pandemic occurred, people used to often say, oh, local communities are not really benefiting from tourism. They're not getting enough from tourism. But the pandemic showed that they are because the moment tourism disappeared overnight, poaching went up so high. In Uganda, it more than doubled. And I know all over the Africa and other countries in the world, in Southeast Asia, probably South America, it also went up and showed that tourism was really helping sustain conservation, which is something which is very nice, which we can carry beyond the pandemic. But we just have to make sure that when tourists come, the money that they bring has to support the local communities even more. So that part has to continue. But also it's another wake up call that you can't just depend on tourism to sustain conservation. In our case, we, we realized that a lot of the time people are approaching because they're hungry. As we distributed the fast growing seedlings, we carried out a survey. It was actually 1,000 households, not 1,000 people, which so we actually reached about 6,000 people through the 1,000 households. Um, and during this pandemic, we found, we asked them, what is the, how have you been most affected by the pandemic? What's causing people to poach? And they said hunger. And because that we realized that they're totally given up, you know, digging because, you know, in one day you can earn $50 from a very happy tourist who's seen a gorilla. And that's what someone earns in a month in the community, someone who's doing well. So people just abandoned what they used to do before. But now what we did is we got them to go back to what they used to do before, but in a sustainable way. So we're using sustainable soil and water conservation methods for the urban farming method in a small plot where they can keep having, keep maintaining themselves. And we gave them 10 fast growing seedlings. But the message we're bringing them was that this is not just a short term measure, but it's also a long term measure. Even when tourism comes back in full swing, they shouldn't abandon that. The money from tourism can support maybe school fees or something else, but it shouldn't go towards feeding them. So that's something else that we're doing, thinking of doing beyond the pandemic. And one thing that's also going to continue is wearing of masks. <laughs> you know, before the pandemic, 
as I mentioned, that you know the gorillas have had ever picked up respiratory diseases and chimpanzees, not only in Uganda but other countries. But during the pandemic, um, it showed us that you know a lot of people are like, after the pandemic ends, will people still have to wear masks? Yes, they will, because I think the gov the message has come across that you know COVID is there. There can be something else that comes, and actually. You know, amongst the One Health community, we're all thinking that the Delta variant is almost behaving like a different virus. <laughs> you see what I mean? We still have a lot ahead of us, unfortunately, with this pandemic. And we just, any other thing can come even worse, even more virulent to kill the great apes, which are actually really lifting people out of poverty. So wearing of masks has now become the new norm and it's not going to change even after the pandemic ends, even after all people are vaccinated, which unfortunately in Uganda is only about 4%. Um, we need to get those vaccines into Uganda. We're hearing about booster doses in UK and US. In Uganda, most, many people don't even have access to the first dose in other many countries in Africa. So that equality issue needs to be handled as well. But, you know, going forward, I think more money should go into healthcare and more money should go into conservation and making sure that we're not just depending on tourists to sustain conservation. So some of those are things which we see. With Gorilla Conservation Coffee, we're expecting to get most of our buyers from outside Uganda and not only within Uganda. And, you know, because we realize that you can't depend on tourist, tourism to survive. But we are working also with other groups to advocate for these all across the 10 countries in Africa that have gorillas and the 21 countries that have great apes. And we're trying very much to make sure that we scale up bits of our model um, in different ways, working with local partners on the ground. Fantastic, and that, that, that's, a, that's a fantastic answer for what is in, an incredibly complex question. I appreciate that. I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry I asked you such a complex question in some ways. And I think what you're saying here really highlights the, the sort of COVID vaccine inequality that exists in the world at the moment as well, and how we take that forward will be interesting. We had a question here from um, our own Monique McKenzie, who works in the School of Maths and Stats, looking at, um, in, in some areas, looking at poaching in Southern Africa, amongst other areas. And her question is that in other parts of Africa, um, we've seen that poaching has been interrupted with a lack of movement in people and planes, for example, across borders. Has this been your experience? I guess from what you were saying, oh, you're, you've actually seen an increase in poaching. Yes, that's a very good question. There's been a doubling of bushmeat poaching all over Africa. I believe also in South Africa, it's really increased, but the poaching for elephants and rhinos, which requires, you know, cause it's mainly driven from, from outside, you know, like places like Vietnam, China, like they're looking for elephant ivory, they're looking for rhino horn. The, the lack of air travel has reduced that poaching, but the bushmeat poaching has gone up all over and just shows that people are poaching cause they're hungry. And what do we do about their hunger? We have to do something because you can't expect them to survive. They have to feed themselves. And so, yeah, so some elements of poaching have gone up and some haven't, but as conservationists, we need to find other ways to support these people. Some people are even thinking of like bonds, you know, other countries pay bonds to maintain their natural heritage in other countries. Um, there's lots of discussion about how do we support conservation beyond tourism. Okay, fantastic. The next question that we have, comes from uh, Moira Sharkey, who asks, have you faced any particular challenges as a woman working in conservation, particularly as one spearheading a new approach? <laughs> That's a whole new presentation. <laughs> but yes, I have faced challenges. Um, I'm actually in Dubai, speaking from Dubai Expo. Uh, I, was, I was able to come over. It's the first conference I've attended since the pandemic. And this week, um, there's, a, there's a women's pavilion that has been built. If you ever get a chance to visit, it's an amazing exhibition. Really pleased that my photograph is in there. And they're basically looking at all the challenges women have faced over the years, not just in conservation, but health, development, politicals, politics, everything. More representation of women is needed. But I was on a panel of very dynamic women yesterday, and all of us are working in different ways in conservation. One is a marine biologist from Bahrain, Another one is a um, very well-known climate activist, and Christina from Costa Rica. There's a range of people, someone from L'Oreal, and someone from the government here. And all of us, like, there was a big discussion about women in conservation. I would say that there's always that big 
you know, all of us have has to face cultural norms. You know, women are not considered to be, they should, they're not thought to go out and work in remote areas. That's supposed to be for men. And just trying to break those societal norms has been something that we've all had to face. Um, and also another thing that we've had to face is, you know, when I first started working with the gorillas, there were no female rangers at all. And, you know, as the only woman out there, out in the field, the rangers were very kind. They let me walk in front. Others not as physically fit as them. They love to have a senior person with them in the field. And I was the first vet in Uganda to work with wildlife. So everybody respected me in the institution. The men took me seriously because I brought a unique expertise to the field. I'm pleased to say that now the number has gone to 20% rangers who are female. It should be more, but at least we're making progress there. Um, and so we're all seeing that we need to have that. And one thing that came up in the discussions yesterday was that there is this thing of quota for women. It's needed because, you know, they need that extra push to get up there, but you need to have that quota in order to have equal representation. So there's a lot of discussion about that. I'm also on the Women Environment Leadership Council, where Leila Haza, who's also seen Andrew's Prize Award winner, she initiated this and invited to me on that invited me to be on the council and we're advocating for women leadership in conservation there's very few women heading institutions in conservation very very few and here at the expo there was one lady who's now heading uganda tourism board i've worked with her for many years lilia jarova i actually mentioned her because she came to my presentation i mentioned how she's actually someone who's inspiration you know there's that glass ceiling they don't want women to head big institutions it's still considered an old boys club men very few women in board positions we really need to change that because conservation equally affects both when we we engage the reform poachers during the pandemic the lucky there's one meeting where there were women and their wives came as actually the only other women in the room and they said they actually pressurize their husbands to go and poach when when they don't have enough food on the table or they need medicine because they think bushmeat can make you well so it's really important to engage women at all fronts and we're glad that because we're looking at both health and conservation together we're able to engage women and men equally fantastic thank, thank you uh, gladys the next question comes from it's an anonymous question but they wanted to thank you for what was a really inspirational talk and i agree with that um what message would you have for the delegates at the cop 26 meeting which is actually coming to scotland in the course of the next few months well <laughs> i would say that um you know climate change has been has we've seen quite a lot of it uh, as has been mentioned by the principal Sally mapstone like you know we've been seen floods everywhere we've seen fires everywhere and it's something that needs to be taken very seriously um and i would say that the message for the delegates is integrated approaches is the best way to address climate change it can't just be addressed separately just as you know, the One Health approach is helping. Many other integrated approaches are needed. We, we had a discussion actually this morning that the SDGs, they're 17, but still they're separated. Even rural development is a different SDG from urban development. We need to have a lot of integration in order to be able to address climate change, to address pandemics such as these ones, to really achieve the conservation and biodiversity goals. So an integrated approach, thinking multidisciplinary, holistically working together across sectors. I think I believe is the way forward and I'm glad that I, I've seen it in the presentations of the finalists. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the next question comes in from, from Gertrude who asks how are governments in the region helping you to tackle the challenge of the long-term sustainability of your projects? The governments in the region I would say are helping. I mean I would say that they're adopting the policies that we're advocating for them to do you know, for example, when we brought up the issue of mask wearing, <laughs> you know, just as I left Scotland, sorry, in my presentation, I was saying 2019, I meant to say 2020, just as I left Scotland. And the discussion actually began while I was in Scotland. And then now seeing everyone wearing masks, they've adopted it in Uganda, in Rwanda, DRC had already adopted it earlier, but Uganda and Rwanda adopted it and we're expecting all the other countries too. So where the governments can help to sustain our, our work is by adopting the policies that the policy recommendations we put forward and also to have ownership of the teams. For example, the village health and conservation teams, you know, the Ministry of Health, has, you know, has got that structure where we're training those people to do conservation work. The Wildlife Authority has worked with them to talk to the communities. They need to start owning whatever we start. They need to really start owning it. 
And I would say that that's how I see the government supporting, adopting the work that we're doing in their policies and supporting the community groups that we help to initiate so that everything moves forward and it enables us to scale to other places because they're looking after the ones where we began. So absolutely. Um, a question here which has come from from uh, from Bill who's, who's down the coast again in Anstruther. So do you think the collapse of the international tourist market and tourist travel creates new opportunities for internal market tourism and a change in national views towards your conservation efforts? Yes, it created an opportunity for domestic tourism to grow because we were at the point where there was a lockdown for six months. You're like, what do we do? Um, and it was necessary. I have to say CTPH, our organization, really, really advocated for tourists not to come during the pandemic. Thankfully, there were lockdowns all over the world because, I mean, the first part of the pandemic, we were concerned that they would cough on gorillas, or chimpanzees, and something, you know, would lose them. And the government really embraced that. I was really pleased when the president of Uganda, in his address in May 2020, said, we're opening up for other places, but not the, our cousins, the gorillas and chimps. We, we can make them sick. I was really pleased to be on the TV when he said that, when, you know, to hear him saying it when I turned on the TV. So it's something that the government of Uganda really, really takes seriously, which is important. But also one thing that came up is, hey, we need to visit our national parks. And people, once they really, once the lockdowns went down within the country, you know, people started visiting the national parks. There's a big drive for domestic tourism. I think it's really, really important that people need to start visiting their national parks. And because they couldn't go to London, you're a middle class Ugandan is like, I want to go on holiday. I'm going to go to London. I'm going to go to Dubai. They couldn't go anywhere. So now where could they go? They had to visit the national parks, which is very, very important. And I think, yeah, that's an opportunity. One of the silver linings of the pandemic is domestic tourism has to grow. We can't just rely on international tourists. Fantastic. Um, the last question I'm going to ask you it come, actually comes out, I assume, from one of our students, even though it's an anonymous question, which says, you know, what are the possibilities in the future for students at St Andrews to get involved and help you with the charity, either in Uganda or as social enterprise representatives in the UK or anywhere else in the world? Um, the opportunities are great. We actually host students. I think I showed in my presentation, we host students from around the world. They can come over. Um, some of them even wanted to come last year, but then the university would not allow them because <laughs> students are, are, you know, they're willing to go somewhere where no one else, even in a place, tourists are not yet are too scared to go. Um, but unfortunately, the universities would not allow them. And but we do, we do host students. They can come and do their research. They can learn about what we're doing, and they can also help us to conduct research. We can also host students virtually. They can help us to analyze data. They can help us to analyze our business models. We had students from a university in America um, who who helped us to like do refine our business model for Gorilla Conservation Coffee. So we we get we host students from around the world, either virtually or in the country, who can help us. And we also want them to team up with local students from Uganda. Um, we haven't been able to accomplish that yet because it requires raising funds for the local students as well. But it's it's a great way for the local and the international student to learn a lot from each other. And yeah, no, it's something that really is contributing to our work. And that's how I started out as a conservationist. I did a study from the Royal Vet College on gorilla parasites, and that's how I ended up where I am now. <laughs> Fantastic. I just want to say thank you again so much, Gladys, for both for the inspirational presentation that you've given us, for the efforts that you and your, your partners have made in the course of the last, last 18 months in probably the most difficult situations that many of us have found ourselves in, and also for you taking the time out of your really busy schedule in Dubai today to come and talk to us and taking the time to provide those really insightful answers to the questions our community have answered. So, I'm, very much I'm, and all your support. Mm -hmm. thank, thanks again, Gladys. I just want now to move on to uh, the final part of the event, I suspect, which many are waiting with bated breath for. And I think this now takes us to the matter of the winner of the, of the 2021 St Andrews Prize for the Environment, at which stage I'm very pleased to hand over now to Dr Hayatan Silam, who will make the announcement. So Hayatan, over to you. Thank you so much, Tom. 
And I'd like to just start by really congratulating Gladys on the incredible progress made during such a difficult year. And you answered all the questions so brilliantly. I think you, you, you've shown our finalists what a high bar we have for the winner of the St Andrews Prize. And actually, you all who've been joining us this evening have seen for yourself the quality of finalists that we've had this year. And on behalf of all the judges, I would like to congratulate our excellent finalists and commend them on the very important work that they are each doing. We, we really never fail to be uplifted and impressed by the, the passion, the commitment, the creativity of the change makers that we get to meet through the prize. And this year was absolutely no exception. But, <laughs> this is the drum roll, there was one project that stood out to us for the power of the approach that they adopted, blending a deep and nuanced understanding of and connection with Indigenous knowledge and rigorous science, an approach which we found deeply inspiring and which we believe has the potential to drive systemic change and impact at scale for climate and communities, which is very much what this prize is about. And that project is, of course, Snow Change. <laughs> and so, Tero, many, many congratulations to you on your absolutely outstanding team. It was an honour and honestly, truly moving to hear you talk about your work. And I speak on behalf of all of the judges when I say that we're truly thrilled to be awarding you the 2021 St Andrews Prize for the Environment and the winner's cheque for $100,000. And we're really excited to see the difference it's going to make. And we hope that it will demonstrate to the Sami who are involved in Snow Change the respect that we have for them and how much we value the work that you're doing together. So Taro, I would love you to say a few words at this point. Many congratulations. Thank you, Kitos. Kito in Sami for those that are our allies in the indigenous Sami world. Um, the hour is precious. We couldn't have um, a better team of finalists. So I want to congratulate Planet Indonesia and our Brazilian colleagues. Um, we are in it together. Thank you for all of your work. This is a recognition for all of us. And uh, we are in broad alliance around the world. Let us not be divided. Let us be in a front of united action to save our home, save our people and uh, this precious planet. Thank you so much, Teru. That was a very moving message. Thank you very much, Teru. Thank you very much. And <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me also offer my warmest congratulations on behalf of all the judges again to our absolutely superb runners up. As you said, Teru, they are very worthy finalists. So Cities Without Hunger Brazil and Planet Indonesia, we congratulate you too on your achievements to date. And we greatly look forward to seeing how your projects develop. And to help you along the way, you will each, of course, receive $25,000 in prize money. So before I hand back to Professor Mapstone, I'd like to just thank all our judges who made, as always, excellent contributions and insights um, to the to the in, sometimes rather intense debates. So thank you all for making those difficult decisions feel so convivial. And at this point, I will pass back to Professor Sally Mapstone for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hart, and, and Hello again, everybody. And let me start by adding my, my very warmest words of congratulation to the winner of the St Andrews Prize for the Environment for 2021, the Snow Change Cooperative. Well done uh, for a fantastic submission. And I'd also like to offer our, our very, very warm congratulations to our, our two very worthy runners up, Cities Without Hunger and Planet Indonesia. I know, I know I speak on behalf of all of the judges when I say that throughout the process, we have been blown away by the work of Snow Change Cooperative. As Houghton said, the, the nuance of its mission and the sensitivity with which that is approached, its potential geographical expansiveness, its ambition and the quality of its results so far. Indeed, one of the prize's long-standing judges said that Snow Change's presentation was, and I'm quoting, the most impressive and intelligent that I recall 
from my time on the prize. So very well done to you, Tero, and your colleagues. That is not to say, of course, that this decision was an easy one to make. And we've seen today that the work of these three projects and that of the 2020 winner, the wonderful Dr. Gladys Kalema Zixuka and Conservation Through Public Health is hugely impressive. So each of you, Gladys, Tero, Adam and Christian, have identified environmental mental challenges and responded through superb innovation and organisation. It is so good that the cash prizes each of you has attained can boost that continuing work, thereby maximising its impact and supporting its expansion. And as alumni of the prize, you are now also alumni of our university and you operate with the support of a global network of leaders, researchers and graduates with shared values and resources and a will to see you succeed. I'm hugely looking forward to seeing the difference each of your projects will make. What these projects demonstrate is environmental leadership, and I want to close today with a focus on this, as it is clear that none of us can afford to be spectators, for the impacts of climate change are being felt all around us to worsening degrees. And because minimising the extent of these will require a global, collective and coordinated effort in which each of us must become leaders. And to be completely clear, this can no longer be about discussing climate change or awareness raising. Like each of our finalists, our attention must resolutely turn to implementing actionable, scalable changes, personally, but also institutionally. This is something that we're doing at the University of St Andrews. In January of this year, the University Court, that's our sup supreme governing body, approved the university's environmental sustainability strategy with the headline commitment to become net zero for carbon and all forms of environmental degradation by 2035. Planning to achieve that aspiration is being progressed by our Environmental Sustainability Board, founded in 2020 and led by Professor Sir Ian Boyd, a professor in our School of Biology and a judge of the St Andrews Prize for the Environment, and who was also appointed this summer as co-chair of the First Minister of Scotland's Environmental Council. The work to meet the university's net zero target is being owned at the very highest level of the university. We are currently in the process of refreshing our university strategy for the period 2022 to 2027. And this new strategy will move sustainability from its existing place as an underscoring principle within our social responsibility statement to a strategic pillar in its own right, evidencing the concentrated strategic focus that this theme is receiving in our community. Now, strategies can be viewed with suspicion and rightly so, but at St Andrews, the university strategy is absolutely central to decision making across our institution. And it is owned by colleagues at every level as a tool to guide their activities. Making sustainability a strategic pillar recognizes that we can only attain our net zero aspiration by integrating it as a determining consideration in all things. The scale of the challenges ahead can be daunting. As an institution, we are needing to ask serious questions about how we maintain our global leadership whilst inverting our effect on the environment, from being dependent on natural resources to becoming a force that sees them replenished in perpetuity. The magnitude of these considerations and those we face on a personal and societal scale are not easy to reckon with, and when coupled with the existential nature of the challenge at hand, can make climate change a daunting subject. So in that context, the St Andrews Prize for the Environment and the projects it supports are a source of both reassurance and inspiration. A demonstration of just a small fraction of the outstanding sustainability work taking place across the world and a remonstration against the idea that there is nothing we can do about environmental change. A further source of inspiration for me is our student body, the members of which 
constantly engage with our sustainability programmes as leaders and for whom climate change is an opportunity to remodel institutions and societies in a way that brings biodiversity and sustainability to the fore. As a university, we have a responsibility to see through that vision. So let me close then by thanking all of you here tonight for attending. Your participation in these activities is an essential part of reorienting our collective thinking about environmentalism. And congratulations once more to our finalists and our winner, the inspirational, authentic and empowering Snow Change Cooperative. We owe all of you our gratitude for your outstanding work and for the compelling visions you've set out for us today. So colleagues and friends, this concludes our St Andrews Prize for the Environment event tonight. Thank you everybody, good evening and see you next year. <laughs>